Welcome to the fourth uh, Digital Disability Film Podcast uh, with Miro Griffiths, Alison Wilde and myself, Paul Dark, the three doctors, as I like to call us. And uh, we're going to be talking about two films specifically today, uh, Pain and Glory, Alma DeVar's movie from last year, and Tell Me That You Love Me, Junie Moon from 1970, a classic from the era. And so let's start with uh, Junie Moon. Mira, let's start with Mira. What did you think of Junie Moon? Yeah, well, I, I, I quite enjoyed it. Uh, I think it, 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 was, it was an enjoyable watch. And I think it raised some really interesting issues uh, about the kind of intersection of, of uh, disability and sexuality, uh, also disability and violence and the, and the, and the uh, you know, creating impairment as a, as a way of punishment, which I'm sure will we can explore a little bit a little bit further and there's also that question around what brings people together because you have you know, the three central characters moving living together and, and how that plays out and i think it, it it raises questions of solidarity and what's the purpose of coming together and how do people understand commonality in the shared experiences of either uh, impairment or indeed how that then manifests in, in society through the experience of disablement but uh, I, no, I quite, I quite enjoyed it, really. Alison, what did you think? Um, yeah, I was, quite, I was quite surprised. Uh, I hadn't really heard of it before. I think Miro suggested you, you suggested me, Miro. Yeah. No, I think it was Paul. Oh, did you? Oh, right. Sorry, Paul. Uh, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't heard of it before. Um, I, I think I had, but, but I didn't really know what it was. Uh, so I was really astonished to find that way back in nineteen seventy. We already knew quite a lot of the answers about uh, about better disability representations, which is not to say it was perfect, uh, um, but the fact that way back in 1970 we could we could do some of the things you said, Miro, and have um, th three proactive uh, uh, disabled people um, or people with impairments uh, actually choosing to live together. And that we could actually, in slightly comedic way, but blending uh, issues of sexuality into that, uh, uh, and uh, and and have lots of other nuances uh, around the differences between impairments, uh, expectations of disabled people, the relation of the relationship of disabled people to the benefit system. All those things kind of came out in that, and and, and I just kept thinking. Why could we do this in 1970s? It just kept coming to your mind all the time. And then then just decades of utter rubbish. Sorry, not not quite, but uh, I, I'm just thinking, you know, it's a bit like watching Freaks again, thinking, but we were doing this nearly 100 years ago and we were doing it in 1970. Like I said, it's, it's not perfect. There were problems with it, but um, I found it really entertaining, really engaging, was really quite surprised. I, I, I thought it was a... A really fun film to watch. Yeah, I liked it a lot. Uh, well, I'd say I, I enjoyed it too. I, I've waited a long time to see this. I've I've, I've, I've had it a while because I think it's on some of the streaming services. But I, I'd heard about because it it's an Otto Preminger film, and Otto Preminger yeah. uh, makes very odd, strange films by and large. With a, there are often political intent and insight. <clears throat> and Otto Preminger, for example, is, is the guy who broke, in theory, along with Kirk Douglas. The blacklisting of uh, the kind of communist uh, thing in the House of Un-American activities, but I, I think if if it's very interesting to think of it as a companion piece to something like uh, the Raging Moon. Have you ever seen the Raging Moon, either of you? No. <coughs> which in America was called uh, Long Ago Tomorrow, which uh, again is baffling as why well, it had a different title which is a Brian Forbes film, made at fundamentally exactly the same times as Malcolm McDowell and Nanette Newman. <laughs> uh, the, it, and it has the similarities in the sex that the two main characters have sex and one dies basically as a result of that, which is quite bizarre. But the British film very much is about the institutions, uh, homes for disabled people, and it legitimates it, the British one, which is very interesting. And I think it may be worth that we, we, we actually look at that film another time because I think it's, it's fascinating because it's got some really good stuff. And, and it was the film Malcolm McDowell made after Clockwork Orange. It's the complete opposite of all that kind of thing. 
But I, I thought that Genie Moon was way ahead of its time, actually. Although it does have elements of other films. So, for example, The Men, Marlon Brando. There's a, they, Americans do have a kind, of, a kind of genealogy of progressive cinema in relation to social issues, which I think is quite interesting. And this is very firmly placed in that, in that kind of civil rights moment that I think that made it very yeah. fascinating, very interesting. Otto Preminger was part of that. Uh, you know, he, he was a, a Jew who left uh, Nazi Germany, for example, etc. And so he, he did understand kind of political notions of identity and oppression. And I think that comes across. But I, I think it has a lot of really good stuff in it. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you, Alison and, and Miro. Yeah. I think it, it has problematic moments. And... And of course, the other thing is, is it's incredibly dated. Uh, yeah. I think it's, it's very difficult to watch a film. There's some eras where you can almost get like 1940s films. You don't, you can almost, you don't notice that they're black and white and 1940s. You can get over that. But there's a, there's a kind of specific area, kind of like mid 50s to mid 70s, where they are all so dated because they try and include music of the era. They have a certain type of performance that actually affect how you whole see it. And, and this, this suffered from that, but again, it's about seeing it of its time as well. So it's, it's fascinating. So what would, you, what would you see as the key problems before we come to the really good things about I, it, uh, Alison? I, I, think, I, I think one of the things she says is, all, is kind of also its weakness uh, in that um, there definitely is an agenda there uh, to, to overturn things. And um, even though I welcomed it, uh, for example, we do have, I mean, we, we have the issue of sexuality, which has done quite well in that it, it, it become, it, 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 it's, it's, it kind of, that's a story that grows. But um, I suspected when um, the, uh, um, oh, I've forgotten her name now, was it Minnie, uh, the black woman uh, yep. who... Yeah. Yeah. Who, who Junie had met in hospital uh, comes to the house and it was almost like uh, it was a bit of a tick box being played and similarly with uh, uh, when they go they go on holiday and and the black men in it it's almost like there was a, a bit of an element of, of make sure all the bases are covered and I think that was um, to me reasonably obvious and I, I, I mean maybe he didn't do that but it felt a bit like that was that was going on but at the same time I welcomed that because it's like a black disabled woman how often does that happen very 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 rarely mm -hmm. so so I, having said that you asked me to look at the faults and I'm going back to the, the best bits about it I, th I think uh, sticking with the faults I think uh, the character Arthur who I was quite fascinated by um, was ep epilepsy. Um, uh, I don't want to do a spoiler. No, don't worry about spoilers. All right, okay. Um, uh, I was just, just, there was no need for him to die. There was really no need for him to die. Why did that happen? Why? There was no need for it. The narrative did, did and, and actually, because I thought it was a, a really good representation of, if you like, disabled womanhood. She was very strong, uh, uh, very guarded in her own uh, uh, trust of, of, of going into a relationship again, which I think would be reasonable after what had happened to her. Um, Arthur dying at that point kind of left me with a really, really bad feeling uh, as a disabled woman uh, that she was going to end up settling from Mario the fishmonger, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I, I, and that was a, a real, real letdown at the end of the film. It's like, <laughs> oh no, surely she's not going to go off with Mario. Not that there was anything wrong with Mario, but no, no, she was going to end up with the fishmonger. Oh, that was that, <laughs> that's inevitable. Well, I think it also well because when he at the end when he picks up the dog and says, "You'll like me no matter what," <laughs> so, well, <laughs> clearly that's going to be his tactic for. Uh, for Liza Minnelli. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love looking at the trivia. So I love that so, so many people uh, love Lisa Minnelli's performance and it was so emotional. And it was because her mother had just topped herself in London <laughs> <laughs> as she was making it. And she sort of brought all that emotion to it, which, which is just fascinating. And I love that Otto Preminger was banned from the town for doing <laughs> the nude scene in the cemetery without telling anybody. Uh, oh, wow. 
so that didn't go down well either. Uh, and they, they tried that to sue him. That was disturbing. That, I thought we were entering horror film territory at that point. And then, uh, uh, although it was also the most cinematic, perhaps, aspect of the film as well. Sorry, I interrupted you. Mm. But, no, I, I, and I'd say the film isn't very cinematic, but that, that scene is quite cinematic. <laughs> uh, but yeah, then it swerved into a different film, <laughs> it felt for me. I thought, what was, well, I thought at the time, I can't remember if it was your, your choice, but I thought, what on earth is, have, have we been sent to watch this time? <laughs> After that particular scene, oh no. Uh, well, it's, it's funny because... It's shallow Ot territory. <laughs> and Otto Preminger was a terribly humiliating uh, director as well. So James Coco, uh, the fishmonger, he, he, he said he'd never work with him again, and Lisa Minnelli said he'd never work with him again. Oh, he, really? He humiliated them regularly that was his tactic as a director oh, wow. and probably as a character and in fact james coco then did more movies with him but lisa Minnelli didn't uh so uh but i, I it's funny because i i just <laughs> bizarrely i didn't have a problem with him dying uh, in the sense that it, that's typical of a film uh i think it, it didn't step out of its kind of narrative con confines and i didn't i didn't what did think, he die of yeah, <laughs> that's what sex for the first time does to you. We're all lucky to still be alive. <laughs> mm. uh, I I thought the whole point uh, to me. I thought it wasn't really overt, but I thought he was going to die from the beginning. Actually, I because for yeah. example, there was no reason for him to be in hospital. <laughs> Which, if you think about it, why is this bloke in hospital? But that was just really so I took that he he had a he had something a version of epilepsy that meant he would die uh, uh, so uh, I think and it added to that emotion and I didn't mind those kind of you know fairly cliche narrative structures so I, I didn't have a problem with that and uh, and of course I was there's a great family guy of Peter Griffin every they, whenever you go and see a movie and they say the title when they say the title he goes ah, that's the title of the film and of course his last words are, tell me that you love me, Jimmy you mean? I'm going, that's the title of the film. <laughs> My Peter Griffin moments, which, uh, which I think are really funny. Uh, I, I, thought, I thought the black stuff, the black characters, were actually very specifically to enable the audience to contextualise the civil rights notion for disabled yeah. people and gay people. So I think it was over, uh, it was kind of like uh, over and in your face. But I think there's a there's a line in it when they're leaving the posh hotel, when he said when he tries to give them the bill and he tears it up and he says, you know, uh, we're all black as far as I'm concerned. And that's one of yeah, the lines well, in it. Well, I think it blacks but, blacks have to stick together, isn't it? Yeah, and and yeah. And, I, and I thought. The whole point is, is America was understanding civil rights yeah, for a yeah. particular group in the media. And, and it was sort of saying, you know, look, there's these groups as well, and it's just as applicable. So, I, again, it's, it's a very political film. And, again, that, that's yeah, quite yeah. interesting for the era. Uh, so, Miro, what did you think? Come back to you. Yeah, well, I th I th well, I th it's hard when you said to, to kind of separate out the, the problems and the, and the positives of it. it, it it's quite hard, I think similar to what Alison was, was alluding to, it, it, it mixes up its problems in with its, in its, with its progressiveness. I think on one hand, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, as, as I said at the beginning, that question of what they gain from, from coming together in terms of their commonality. And I suppose, it, I suppose in one way, it, it doesn't necessarily challenge that notion of normality because it, you know, you, they, the, the validity comes from them coming together, absolutely. But they find that you know they kind of the solace comes from trying to assimilate into everyday life and 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 brush over some of the aspects of uh, oppression and marginalization that they, that they experience. Uh, you know, so for example, the next door neighbor I thought was quite interesting the way that you know he sees them as inferior. He sees them almost as as a as a as a, as a you know as a disgusting oh, aspect yeah. to look upon. Yeah. And yet that doesn't that's not really resolved other than just pointing that pointing a finger to it and saying it's, it's, it's there, it happens. Um, and so that, that, that was a little bit problematic for me as well. Uh, as, as, I suppose it's also something, Arthur's character was interesting because I thought it, it, 
it typified that notion of being a disabled person in a residual uh, welfare regime, which is, of course, what, what America is. You know, the idea of the stigma associated with accessing welfare, uh, not wanting to access it at all, not wanting to conform to the expectations of, of, what, um, of what is wrapped up in, in trying to, to uh, rely upon on, on welfare. Uh, and you can see that again, you know, in, in his notions of trying to uh, gain employment, definitely trying to gain employment, criticizing Warren for, for being inactive or you know, trying to almost create a, a sense of hierarchy of, of worth and value, which I thought was, which was, was quite interesting and, and would have been, would have been useful. Would be interesting to explore that. I think a little bit. You mean we're all we're all freaks, so don't try and steal the show. That line was a great line. I thought. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I thought that was that was quite interesting. And I th also thought the character of Gregory, the land the landlady, was 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 interesting as well. You know, that kind of that that fixation of of voyeurism and curiosity of yeah. assuming that uh, impairment effects are associated with with the mind, and, that, and therefore. If you think positively, you can get out your wheelchair and, and, and run around. Um, yeah, I think, so, go on, carry on, sorry. Yeah, and I just thought that, that was interesting because when she, when she, you know, as soon, as soon as she meets uh, um, Junie's character, it's what's happened to you. That kind of questions around this figure no. and different. Then with Warren, it's, yeah, but why are you a wheelchair user? Surely you can walk if you really tried hard enough. And then with Arthur, it's almost a moment of relief because when she meets him, it's like, oh, no, thank goodness you look normal. Yeah. I thought that was that was really uh, re a really significant part of the way in which we we understand difference and the way in which we tolerate difference as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and I, that that was one of the strongest things to me that started off with. Which after the after the scene where she uh, made more, made Warren uh, walk kind of disappeared, but until then I, I thought this is. Uh, a really powerful film in that it, it kind of corresponds to some of those things that Rose McGowan Thompson said about um, uh, about kind of passive and active staring and all that kind of thing. And in some ways, it was quite refreshing, particularly it was given so old that that she was being really upfront about those things rather than uh, r rather than kind of uh, insinuations and things like that. But then, of course, when she makes him walk, it kind of becomes something else and then it it, it 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 kind of dropped from my concerns after that yeah and I, and I think you know i think also in terms of problems I, I think most of my problems came from the cinematography and the way it was filmed so you know they kind of um you know revealing the bat the bandage taking off the bandages to reveal the scarring you know they, they attempt to hide the disfigurement um and then and then reveal it at a kind of crescendo moment in front of the mirror which then immediately goes back to a case a sense of longing for yeah, Minnelli, Minnelli thinks about when it happened, but it starts with you know longing for uh, exploration of sexuality, of having a good time, of having yeah. of having freedom. And I thought that was that was you know my my main problems were with, with the kind of yeah the cinematography aspects of it. And I, I I thought it was also quite interesting. A lot of the time when Minnelli was trying to have fun or was trying to uh, kind of gain confidence, there was a I, I felt anyway there was a hiding of the disfigurement. But, you know, exactly. And exactly. you know, when you see her dancing with Arthur in the bedroom, you all when, whenever she's on the camera, it's it's the the the, 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 the non yeah it's the side yeah. that hasn't been burnt by yeah by I agree really strongly yeah I agree and I think that so that kind of so sometimes I think that undermines the 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 really yeah. excellent point that is uh, yeah. trying to be made in the film. But again, I think that doesn't necessarily come from the script or the story. It comes yeah. possibly from the way it's been. But the, by, but by the cinema. I, I think you're both being a little unfair in the sense that I think I can see what you're saying, and a a that that's what film does anyway. So I, I did, I, you know, you can say it shouldn't do that, but actually this is the seventh, so I didn't have a problem with that. But equally, I thought that was about the character as well. Always wanted to show her her, her good side and was rooted in a kind of self hate that was culturally constructed, and so I I, I thought that was a very good insight into a character that about always trying to just show that nice putting the scar to the chest and whatever and on the dancing and and so i, I didn't I, th I thought that was a little bit a bit better than you're giving it credit for thing i think it was intentional and i don't think it was i think it was an insight into the character and that notion of uh, you know the self-hate that uh, so many of us uh, go through have whatever and so i i, I didn't ever i loved the the rich woman tried to make the dog walk scene. I thought that was fantastic because it said so much because it was about money, it was about wealth, 
and it was about charity. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the money if you can be normal. And, and that was a kind of perfect encapsulation of the notion of charity, of rich people throwing money at stuff to make it go away. They don't have to see it. And what they want to see is kind of like normalized versions of that. Uh, and thrown in with religion, because it was all about a cross as well. well yeah, and also, I, well, I like, I also thought, and again, I can probably, you know, I'm, I'm doing this now because I'm obviously thinking about it in the context of the current welfare regime, but also that notion of conditionality and, puni and, 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 and punitive actions that come from being displeased with the outcome. So, you know, the idea that she's got extreme wealth, you know, she says the cross is worth a hundred thousand dollars. You can, you know, give a condition on it. You can have it if you can walk. But when, when he, when he fails the test, which obviously he would fail. In, 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 <laughs> and I was hoping that this wasn't going to be a moment where he does regain the, uh, the ability to walk. But when, but when, uh, when he, when he uh, displeases Gregory, you know, the, the punitive sanctioning of throwing away the money, destroying the item, so there's no, so it no longer has yeah. any worth to him. And of course, you know, the question would be, well, actually, if you were intended to give him the money, just give him the money. So, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah so, but again, it's that kind of wrapped up with, with the kind of punitive sanctions which is reflective of today's society, we think about the welfare regime and the way in which we give social security. It's wrapped up in meeting certain conditions and of course, it's wrapped up in, in punitive sanctions which are, are, are wholly not justifiable at As all. the state throws billions and billions down the drain. <laughs> 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 On Absolutely. things of no use whatsoever. <laughs> just, going back to the, just going back to the beach though, I thought that was quite an interesting section of scenes because I, you know, it, 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 as Warren is developing a relationship with, um, I can't remember the character's name, um, the kind of you know, the, the the person who works at the hotel, um, yeah. You you see how accessibility and his access needs start to become embedded within their relationship, and it becomes a a sense of an ordinary relationship. Okay, yes, he has to be carried around because of the the inaccessibility of the environment, but you start to see how that you know it becomes an ordinary part of their relationship as, as it develops. You know, the people ne don't necessarily stare, the people don't necessarily question it when he's integrating with his with his friends. Uh, social networks but then also I thought it was quite interesting because as that's developing you then get the moment where his the person who he's who he's forming a relationship with um, comes over to him and says oh you know sitting in that sitting in the sofa you know you look like normal almost and I, and I thought and I, and I didn't really understand the kind of the connection between those, those two points because on the one hand I thought it was trying to demonstrate how ordinary life can be if we if we you know if we embed accessibility and access needs and and acceptance of, of difference, but then also to kind of reduce it back down to that question of, are you doing that so you can pass as normal? And isn't that, I thought that was quite good in the sense that it wasn't him saying it, it was someone else. It was a non-disabled person saying it. And it actually, it, to some extent, it doesn't matter what you do, you're gonna be interpreted as being, doing that by normal people who want to validate the notion of normal. So I, I, I thought that uh, that was quite good. I, I, I was very impressed, actually. It was much better than I imagined it would be. Again, having watched uh, Long Ago Tomorrow, uh, The Raging Moon, not too long ago, uh, which we will do uh, in, in a future one. But I think I, 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 I thought there was very little wrong with it, really, actually. I think my biggest problem... Well, I, think, I think there's one thing, actually, that was referred to, uh, and I think this is often true when you look at, when you look at gender and impairment, is... The the, the the interesting stuff you were talking about um, uh, about work and, and you know shame uh, and and neoliberal ideology and stuff that Minelli wasn't in an, in those uh, conversations yeah. to to any extent you know the whole thing about her impairment was about the way she looked and how how that she almost had a spoiled identity as a woman. But the, the the kind of work and shame discourses were largely around uh, uh, masculinity and disability. I thought, which of course, remember, in its nineteen seventies is unsurprising. Uh, but yeah, I think I, I think it's quite good in illustrating that we take a lot of those uh, kind of disability issues without looking at how gender is intertwined within them. But it, but it, I think uh, come back to the thing I thought was slightly problematic, and I think you can probably twist an interpretation of it to make it less problematic was the fact that you had interpreted to some extent uh, the, the Jesse character as gay. That, I think that was pretty, and then the key thing is, is he has sex with a woman. And you're sitting there that thinking, what, what, 
what uh, what what are we doing here? You know, and I, yeah. I and I, you could say it was playing with our perceptions of what we presume to be gay and non-gay. But equally, he was then surprised that he'd had sex with a woman. And so then there was a whole thing about like, is it trying to validate and legitimate kind of like bisexuality and all those kind of things? And and I think it became it became that's when I thought, oh God, you're trying to get absolutely everything in here, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? And that became, you know, and when you start to legitimate fishmongers, you know, you're on a deadly road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I appreciated the bi thing, but it did feel a step too far. It didn't feel quite real. <laughs> yeah, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't suit what you'd been led to. No. Uh, and, and then it just sort of, to the extent that then it undermined it. Yeah, it didn't yeah. validate that bisexuality. It undermined what you had tried to see for the era. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I thought that was that was fascinating. I, 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 I did. You know, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I thought it had some classic lines. I, I thought it was quite, for example, coming back to why he died. Actually, he stopped taking his medicine, so he didn't want to be medicalized. And again, I thought that was a uh, quite a step and, and that was one of the reasons i presume he died because he'd stopped taking his medicine and so i quite liked that agency that it gave that character to do that uh with the consequence that you know he didn't want to be uh numbed and his character and his soul taking her away from him through medicalization even if that yeah. meant shortening yeah. his life and what, then when you compare that with recent films, such as Silver Linings Playbook, where the, the whole redemption of the character is through beginning to take his medicine again. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, right at the beginning, we, we've kind of gone backwards. You know, and, and I think I, I did, I really enjoyed that that notion of uh, of agency that they all had. And I and I thought it had some nice things. So, for example, I think even, even the cottage. And again, <laughs> that was very much playing with that American ideal. It was that idyllic white picket fence, bungalow-esque cottage that is the American dream. Uh, and actually, it was a little bit of a shithole. It was dirty, it was unkempt, <laughs> uh, you know, and they had, to, they had to work together to create the accessibility, you know, putting down pallets and, and planks to make it say, get in. And I, I thought, and the garden was awful. And they had constructed something out of this thing that everyone else had forgotten. And I, I thought it, I thought it was, it was exceptionally good actually. Uh, yeah. And it's so you bring in, time. yeah. Uh, and I, so I think, was there anything else I was going to look at me notes? Maybe, maybe we should remake it. <clears throat> yeah, but you'd want him to survive at the end. <laughs> I could be argued into killing him. <laughs> and I'd be in back at the back going, that's the title of the film. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned something earlier, Miro, that you wanted to talk about, uh, which I've completely forgotten. Uh, there was a, the, I, I thought there was the wrapping up of, of impairment with sexual violence and abuse, yeah. I thought was, 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 was quite interesting. Yeah. The idea of taking action to cause the disfigurement uh, as a way of harming somebody in, in I think almost thinking about impairment becoming a form of punishment and a way to illustrate dominance and control. And I, I thought that was a really fascinating way of, of demonstrating. Of, but on one hand, obviously, it, you know, it, is it done to just provide a, a, a backdrop to a disabled character because you need to know, you know, how how the impairment is it has developed or how it you know becomes um, a prominent in the in the individual's lives. But at the same time, the way in which the impairment is is um, manifests, I thought was 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 really interesting there, and, and equally because they didn't do that to the to the guy in the wheelchair, they they sort of skirted over that uh, in a way that they hadn't with Lisa Minnelli's character, you know, because mm. I don't think they actually tell you how he ended up in a wheelchair. He got shot in some yeah, vague yeah. way, and, and equally even that I thought was quite good being brought up by a gay father. Uh, within a kind of commune thing of, of and I thought again, very, oh, very sixties. Yeah, yeah. And again, it was quite, it was quite interesting, quite radical for its era. It was yeah, like, that, that was a really good sub storyline. Actually, one thing we didn't mention also was when he has text the idea to the hospital people in the first place. And I found that was a really strong scene when he's telling them, he's telling them of his idea for them to live together. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in some ways it was not very subtle, but we get a really strong sense of, of 
uh, standing up to professional and medical discourses of, of, of uh, impairment and disability at that, at that early stage. So, Plus, and, and, and I, I'm not sure it worked particularly well, but it was incredibly critical of the notion of institutions. Yeah. Uh, mm. from, from the kind of feeble-minded, as they call him, in quotes, uh, the person with epilepsy in his home. Yeah. Which there's lots of flashbacks or kind of contemporizations of him now and then with all the grey faces. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't really think that that worked. Well, the, 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 his, his concern... No, the grey faces, the oh. greyness of those characters. I thought you, you don't really need to do that. I thought yeah. it, it, it reeked a trickery that, that didn't... And then he was betrayed by the, the woman who did the lunches who wanted to bring him in and be nice to him just so that they could humiliate him more. So I love that it was absolutely critical that institutions are wrong. You know, marginalisation, segregation does yeah. is wrong and counterproductive. Yeah. I just thought the kind of the technical thing of having them all with grey faces just seemed <laughs> really bizarre. Yeah. Grey faces and red lipstick because the uh, the cook had a red lipstick on for some strange reason. <laughs> well, to identify her as a woman, one presumes. <laughs> so I thought Arthur was. I thought Arthur's, Arthur's character was interesting. Well, sorry, I thought the way that people respond to Arthur's character was interesting. Because you also get the issue of of um, how one should respond to seizures, uh, and I thought that was quite fascinating. Because when he uh, when he wants a job and he first goes back to his old place of work, uh, and his friend said, "Oh, you know, you know, I, you know, I'd give you a job tomorrow if you, if I could," but it's bureaucracy and it's higher management that decide those things, and obviously that's just a ploy to 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 uh, you know dis diminish responsibility. But it's also I thought was quite interesting was, and I think it's, you know again I think broadly speaking it's problematic but that that idea of well you know uh to minimize the the significance of his impairment which is what he's trying to do all the way through the film i think he's trying to he's trying to minimize his impairment to try to get on and and, and uh, participate in society but then there's a you know that that statement of um of what to do when somebody is having a seizure uh is quite interesting you know when so when he goes back to his colleague his old colleague at work his colleague said, oh, you know, my uncle has them all the time. We just ignore them. Uh, and then, of course, when he's having uh, what looks like he's a heart tremors or, or a seizure in, in the bedroom, uh, and Junie comes in, and she immediately just ignores him and starts talking about purple curtains that they should put in the bedroom. I thought there was, there was, there was something in that, in, in, how, in how people think about impairment and how to respond to either impairment needs or the manifestation of impairment. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps, you know, as a society... You know, we, we tend to uh, assume that just by ignoring difference, we are in a way trying to include somebody, which of course is mm, not the case. Mm, mm. Mm. Any more to be said on that? Uh, well, I was, I was just going to say, I thought, the, I thought the opening scene in the hospital was, was one of my favorite scenes because I think it, it ju the juxtaposition between the two, do do the two doctors I thought was quite interesting. You know, you had the, although he was being quite dismissive, you had the one doctor who arrives late and you know, rushes in, which is the way I teach usually, but he, you know, he 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 rushes in and says, uh, you know, starts asking about well-being, and although it's a bit dismissive, he doesn't really listen to what people are saying, like in Minnie's uh, situation at the beginning. You know, that's juxtaposed with the senior doctor who who comes and and treats Junior as an object from the point of curiosity, with a you know with a collection of doctors around them as a as a kind of specimen to observe. And I thought Minnie's line was quite interesting. You know, that idea of uh, I think, well, what did she say? She said something like. Um, uh, you know, a geese around the pond, you know, just all kind of waiting for their opportunity to, to take what they want from the situation, uh, mm. you know, which is what, of what is most useful to them uh, as medical professionals. And I thought that was, that was really fascinating as well. And I thought in, also just, you know, the kind of final point from me, uh, you know, I, I think as I listened to what both of you are saying, you can see how the film is trying to establish the importance of challenging and resisting things. And I think, and I think that is also typified in, in the in having Pete Seeger uh, in the opening and, and closing <laughs> of, the, of the song, you know, yeah, you know, I, I was trying, I was really perplexed at the beginning of why, you know, what, what is, what's the, the significance of that? And then I thought, well, the way I've interpreted it is maybe because you see Pete Seeger being part of that kind of resistance movement and writing songs about the importance of kind of civil liberties and so on, is it a way of 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 using that as a, as a as a point to try to illustrate the importance of trying to challenge the status quo and challenge how 
how things are assumed well, to be. Well, yeah, but, but but it was bizarre. And to be honest, um, I if I didn't know anything about the film and I wasn't watching for this reason, I'd probably be put off and switch off. It went on way too long. <laughs> it, was just, it was just strange. But equally, uh, well, I only did it because Bob Dylan refused to do it. Uh, yeah. Which I thought was quite interesting. But I, 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 I quite like that. Again, it, it was that, again, that problem of uh, it's dated. You know, quite a few films of that kind of early 70s have those moments. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that's my era. I grew up in the 70s and watched a lot of cinema in the 70s. And there's a lot of awful <laughs> shit like that happens. But I did quite like the song, actually. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I quite like Pete Seeger. So old old I, Devil's I Pain. And, and I thought it was about, you know, the whole human experience is, is, is about being human is being in pain. And it was kind of gen genericized that to the whole of humanity. And, and I think it did construct the whole notion of that society constructs these things that enhance pain and don't minimize I, I, it. I get all that, but I think, I think it would probably have misled a lot of people out of it. I think we went to it wanting to watch the film. And I, I think, mm. I don't think, I think for the average viewer, whoever that is, um, it would lead you to expect a different film. I don't think, I don't think, even though the, the content, the lyrics and everything do talk about the content of the film, it, it doesn't kind of, it's quite jarring, I think, with, with actually the narratives of the film. But equally, I think it was probably one of those things at the era, and it did, and that was the beginning, that whole era of, of the soundtrack album. Uh, oh. Uh, which I think is quite interesting. And, and, and so the, the music will come out first. It promotes the film. You get a name there. You know, pre-Elvis pre Presley, you didn't have that in films at all, particularly. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, 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 I just wish he'd walk, been walking through the town so it had some link to it, as opposed to some random forests, you know, or past the hospital or some contextualising thing. That would have done it. That would have done it. That would have done it. And it, it was just really bizarre that he was randomly talking through some woods. It was just like, right. Oh, okay. Uh, so, well, let's move on. I think we're all saying people should see that one. I think that's what we're saying. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's, it's sure. fascinating. It's interesting. It's got a lot of things. And, and, and again, when we look at, uh, we will look at The Raging Moon uh, far long ago tomorrow. In, in, not next time, but the one after that, perhaps. So let's move on to your choice, Alison. <laughs> Pain and Glory, or as it's called in French, or Spanish. in Spanish, <laughs> Dolor y Gloria. Uh, 1919, 2019, God, I'm older than I think. It's an Alma Devar movie, that's all you need to say, really. And he doesn't even give his first name now. An Alma Devar movie. So we'll let you start on this one, Alison. Pardon? We'll let you start on this one. Oh, oh well, I haven't got much to say because I want to hear what you two want to say. Um, uh, and Obviously, just, we're, I, we're anxious on whether you liked it or not and whether oh, we oh, have that, to say I, it was I, crap. I, I love it. I love it, although I have to say I saw it on the big screen <laughs> and I watched it on the little screen this, this time. And, of course, given the beauty of his films, uh, it was not the same experience as being on the big screen. So I'll start with that. Uh, and some people... Um, I don't particularly want to get into it, but I imagine people would say, well, why this one isn't particularly a disability film, but as somebody who has MS and who has chronic illness and pain a lot of the time, my I was blown away when I first saw this film uh, because uh, I think, I was trying to remember when I was watching it the second time where I was blown away the first time. Um, and I think it was because, um, because it kind of embedded all the pain and the way that impacted his uh, the, the the main character uh, uh, Salvador's uh, experience uh, of the world and, and of, of his own life, it was kind of embedded within all the stories. Uh, it wasn't the stories weren't contingent upon it; but it was just always there. And I think that's what blew me away because it, you could see how it informed. Uh, how informed his life. Um, you could see it in, in the kind of artistic and philosophical reflections on, on his life and now how that uh, affected um, his, his, uh, his art. 
and I, I just found it actually really empowering for somebody who has the kind of issues that I have in particular, but also with, as a story within itself, which I think was very cleverly told, bringing two narratives uh, kind of in, into one in quite a surprising, surprising way, I thought. So cinematically, I found it really just, just beautiful. Um, and yeah, but I, I find it hard to find uh, problems with it. My partner doesn't agree with me, but um, yeah, by all means, go ahead and tell me how wrong I am. No, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll start by uh, having my comments that, well, I won't start the second half to you, obviously, is I consider it to be an impairment movie. Now, that would normally be something one would be critical of in the sense that if it's masquerading as being about disability and some kind of political element, in the sense that I saw Junie Moon as a purely political film. It is a, it's a disability film. It's about uh, disablement. The politics of disablement is what that's about. This is about impairment. That doesn't weaken it in any sense whatsoever because it is what it is and it does it gloriously and brilliantly. I don't think it was about any political element of that in the sense that it was about the very personal experience of pain and and how that affects your life and your psychology and i know there's an element of disablement in that disability but actually i think of it more i do very clearly see this as a, as a film about impairment and how it affects every element of your life as as an emotional experience uh, so, but I did, I thought it was excellent. And I think what Alma Devar is very, very good at is because people think of cinema and cinematic as being about large spaces and, and vistas and landscapes. And I think how, what, what, what makes Alma Devar such a great filmmaker is to create the cinematic view in very confined spaces like great art, great paintings, Caravaggio, all of those kind of things, use of light you know, the, 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 the memory of him and his mother in the train waiting room, for example, is, is, very, is very confined, it's very limited, but cinematically absolutely beautiful. Even within the cave, that's all there as well. But again, it doesn't end up being about vistas of, of the, the whole site and the cave. It's about the interiors and they're all in there. So that, that's, I suppose that's what I would start to say. You want to come back, Alison? I, can I, tell. I do. So, sorry, Miro. I, I disagree with you quite profoundly. Uh, I think it is a disability film. I don't think it's an impairment film. And I think we're back to lots of those key debates around impairment dis in disability and disability. And, and, and you know, p personally, I, it, it, th this matters to me as well. Uh, mm -hmm. As in, I think, I, I, I'm obviously, I'm, I, well, hopefully, obviously, I'm well aware of the difference, you know, between in, in, impairment effects, for example, and, and, and uh, uh, so, disability as social oppression but uh, as somebody as somebody whose pain in the world often is is one of the biggest it's not the only problem for me but one of the biggest problems i find the normalcy of the world and i'm using your theory in particular here paul uh, <laughs> i find this challenges all those those um issues of of, uh, of normal ways of being. And there's not many environments that I feel comfortably. Uh, you know, clearly we all have uh, lots of issues around that and mine are probably very different from yours, but I find the normal world in, in many ways um, uh, very oppressive in ways that people can't see as much. Yep. Uh, so, and that, for me, that, that, that shines out in this, uh, particularly with his choice to actually, um, start taking heroin because i think when you when you you kind of look like you're supposedly non-disabled and you have that amount of pain quite often you don't get taken seriously so i, I think it's very subtle in some ways the opposite of journey moon uh, but i think in, in many ways it's exploring aspects of disablement that are really still to this day not very not very clear but are, are like i said deeply embedded in in ideas of normality and how normal bodies work so i disagree no no well no no i'm going to stop you talking here Miro, as well <laughs> if you, you're safe enough I, I i don't disagree with any of that i think that's absolutely true but i don't think it takes it out of the personal 
or even into the political uh, to to make it. And because I think there's, there's, there's absolute validity in that in itself. I don't think we I, you need to make it disability. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean it doesn't and, and it can't be. But actually, there's nothing intrinsically wrong or weak about it being purely what it is. And I, I didn't get that. I get what you're saying. And I think there are elements that it is trying to, to try to break out of that. But I don't think it does. And it, it keeps it in the very personal absolutely brilliantly uh i think the heroine would have been an opportunity to have expanded that kind of political uh, the political concept of disablement in relation to impairment a bit more and I, I agree with you about the normality but it's normality in relation to impairment i saw it uh and again that doesn't mean i'm right and you may well be right uh but i i i didn't get that from it and i suppose i would also say i don't think the audience will get it either uh, and i think that's where, um, and it, they won't have to fight to not get it either, if, if any kind of political element to it. And I, I think one of the barriers to that is, is, the, is the fact that it, and it doesn't particularly deal with it very well, is, is the notion of uh, class, power and wealth. You know, he has status, he is successful, he is wealthy. And, and so that again stops it. That's not questioned in any particular sense, the processes of that. Well, it's, a me it's his own memoir to an extent, isn't it? Yes, so. yes, yeah. Uh, and so, and, and I think, in a way, it's so personal. It, it almost, it doesn't even, it doesn't really leave the head of the individual. It's almost like a, a single point of view piece uh, that I sure. think, sure. but again, I, I do think it's absolutely brilliant and I think it achieves enormous things. Well, awesome. I, oh, you you come back before Miro joins you. Do, just let me just say one thing. I, I think, <laughs> you know, in terms of psycho-emotional aspects of disabledism, I think that's where it lies. Sorry, I'll shut up now. You no, 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 no. I want you to expand on that. Miro's building up for a lengthy speech. Expand on that for me, Alison. Well, well, I mean, in, in disability studies, for example, that the has over the past couple of decades been, been worked by Carl Thomas and, and, and Don... Uh, um, Gosh, Don Reeves. Just, yeah, Don Reeves. Sorry, um, about about psycho-emotional aspects of, of, of disability and disablement, and I, I think that sits very firmly in, in that. And, and in some ways, even though I would normally be very critical about um, disability or impairment told from uh, um, a very affluent perspective, uh, I think in some ways that that kind of adds to it in that even even when you are that affluent and you have had that much success although he's, he's in decline isn't it um it, it's um it, the, the psycho-emotional aspects are still um still that problematic uh but yeah i, I think you know but, but uh, uh reeves work and carl thomas's work kind of partly brought tried to bring together all that stuff on disability studies and, and impairment and I think that's where this lies. So, well, sorry, Miro. Sorry, Miro. No, no, I, I wouldn't disagree that it, that it does that but I think it, it's and again this is the notion of how it's interpreted as well. I, I, I personally didn't feel that Alma Devar was doing that. I think you can take that from it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, and, and I think that, that that's and, and in a way I was a bit disappointed because I think Alma Devar's movies are always incredibly political actually there's a, there's an awful lot of politics that i would have liked a bit more of uh but again it's 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 a great movie miro now it's your time you've got 20 minutes go <laughs> no well, i i i mean i i i don't i don't know necessarily know where i where i position myself in the argument that you've both created but I think for me, it was, um, I, I need more time to think about that. But, <laughs> but for me, I thought what was, what was a really powerful theme in the film was the significance of, of interdependency and the notion of, of relying on others as much as others rely on us in order to function and exist. And I think that was quite interesting from a disability studies scholar perspective and also as a disabled person as well, because I was reflecting on the notion of what is it that we're trying to achieve recognizing our impairment and then the way in which we exist and, and try to participate in, in society and much of the uh demands and activity around activism has been around independence which is often seen as self-sufficiency yeah. and it's seen as kind of self-perseverance and i thought what was really interesting in this film was that notion of recognizing the importance of what others give us 
at different points and you know whether it was recognizing uh you know rebuilding a relationship with somebody as a pursuit of of um um of, a, of taking you know taking heroin in order to reduce the level of pain whether it was rekindling a, an old relationship with somebody to recognize the value and the worth and the yeah. significance that we have in other people's lives that sometimes we don't acknowledge until much later in our, in our lives or indeed about you know re, you know telling those stories and and building up relationships that we have whether it's with uh you know uh, friends or with people who are trying to help us uh you know in the, in the case of of his uh, of his PA or indeed um, uh, his kind of agent, I, I thought that role was. But, I, but for me, that that kind of that notion of interdependency was was really central, and that's why absolutely, I agree. Really, really important, and it and it made me question the the way in which we understand support and the way in which we understand uh, you know autonomy. And perhaps we need to. I, I mean, I, I don't. I'm not saying it's come just from this film, but it grounded that importance of when we talk about autonomy within within the lives of people with impairments and health conditions uh, and in broader, you know, in broader, trying to respond to uh, the, the experience of disabledism. Um, yeah, it's a question of let's not, let's not think of autonomy as self, uh, you know, self uh, perseverance is actually about recognizing the importance that we have on each other at all times. And yeah. I think that's something that we need to try to build into our narratives to illustrate it to those who are disconnected with the world that we, that yeah, we experience or we talk about. Couldn't agree with you more. I, I think also, uh, and I, I think that, that between the social relations in the film, and I think the the, the nice bit for me as well was that fed into uh, the interdependency of of his emotional life with his physical life. So I think that inter interdependency kind of echoed through several aspects of the film. Absolutely, and I think it's it's also I, I suppose you know a, a way of um, of him acknowledging how we reflect and view our life at different stages of the life course you know and i think quite early on in the film um when he you know when he gets out well it starts with him in the pool doesn't it and it, and it kind of focuses on his scarring then it goes through a process of talking about his body but in that you you have that situation where he meets i don't know i don't know who that, it, 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 it's supposed to be a journalist or something but he meets that woman in, in the kind of cafe and he's having a chat with her and he talks about uh the, you know the, the way that film the way that he understands and interprets uh, a particular film and she says I think she says you know it's it's your eyes have changed not the film hasn't changed and again it, I think that was quite powerful as well that kind of notion of yeah. the, the way in which our experiences of our bodies or, or the way our bodies connect to our community or to society and how the different experiences that we have layer upon layer to yeah. affect the way that we interpret ourselves and the way that our bodies function and what is worth and what is value and what is important in yeah. the way that we try to address the, the 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 way that our bodies work but also the way in which our body fits into society mm -hmm. yeah and, and, and I, I wouldn't argue with any of that I, I just don't i don't think it transcended the personal experience particularly to make that broader political things that that i would have wanted from it that i i was disappointed that Almodovar didn't move but actually it's about then seeing it for what it is and i i i, I still don't you know you gotta remember i don't do academia anymore i'm too old and too indifferent to life but uh i i i, I i'd like to hear more on, on why alice in particular why you think it, it it kind of it bridged those that the thing between disability and impairment more if you could say more about that. Well, well I think what, sorry, yeah. I How it bridged, bridged the kind of like impairment slash disability kind of ideas to become a more holistic kind of interpretation. Well, well I'd probably just be repeating myself, actually. I think... Uh, Nothing wrong in repeating yourself. <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> uh, well, well, partly because, I mean, like, like Miro says, the, the, this notion of interdependency and the relationships he has, uh, uh, but uh, this intertwining of that with his, his um, uh, w with with the way he experiences his body and, and 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 how that's affecting you know his pain and his descent into in, into uh, possible heroin addiction and things. Um, so, but I, I don't. I mean, clearly, it's not it's not crit camp, is it? It's it was never meant. It was never meant to be crit camp. Uh, I, 
I, I don't know, there's lots of things it isn't. It's clearly not a story about a poor man uh, who, who's suffering a lot of pain. Uh, and, and like I said, it, it just goes back to those 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 themes like Nero said about interdependence, but also to questioning normality. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm really sorry to say it, but even in kind of the most political things about disability, the, as somebody who is almost constantly in pain, there's often lots and lots of assumptions made about about um, uh, what, what what's happening with people and what they can and can't do. So I think in some ways, even though I can see that it loses some of those more obvious uh, um, uh, disability themes that we get in Crip Camp, I think it, it, it's quite courageous in that it, it, it goes deep into how how uh, pain and barriers are experienced. I think there is definitely, I think there are definitely barriers that should keep showing up in that film. Uh, just to add, sorry, sorry, Paul, just to add to, to, to Alison's point, I think perhaps for me, you know, it, I, I think it, I think it, I, I, I'm more leaning towards Alison's perspective, and I, and I, and I perhaps it, it doesn't emphasize or explore deeply the, the issues of the kind of politics of of disability but it, i think it is there because you do see bits around where he talks you know again it's very quick sentences and statements and more when he's kind of reflecting on his you know when you when you're hearing the kind of internal monologues uh inside his inside his in mind but you have that you know there's there's comments where he says you know we sacrifice the body to pursue ambitions the idea of the body being perceived possibly by others or indeed ourselves around you know the inadequacy of our bodies or the way or, or is it capable of functioning? Can we attend to commitments even though our bodies may be deteriorating or maybe experiencing a considerable amount of pain from different areas as well? And you see that you know at the beginning, you know, he's 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 turning down a lot of of requests or he, he's being non-committal to things, particularly in that space of where you you do see him quite lonely and he's trying to make sense of his body and 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 um, and the relationship that he wants to have with medication or indeed uh, you know uh, drugs in order to to alleviate some of the kind of pain but i think that i think it, it brings to question that notion of what what you know how we pursue our aspirations and our ideas whilst recognizing the significance of the way that our bodies function and for others as well pushing us in certain ways to try to pursue things even though perhaps our body needs to have a certain level of of support whether it's from others or whether it's from medicine whether it's from surgery as a way to try to address the, the fluctuating uh, needs of, of, of the way that our bodies uh, perform and, and, um, and, and function. Uh, I, I, and again, I don't dispute any of that. I think my problem, uh, and again, I don't see it as a problem. I see it as a strength within the film. It doesn't pretend to be anything other than it is, in my view, is that I, I think you could, I would, the way I would articulate is, is I think it doesn't particularly challenge the notion of normality because of the way in relation to pain in the sense that it does have a hankering for pre-pain non-pain as a as a more as a better lived experience and again i'm not speaking that that may well be true if you are in chronic pain but actually the nostalgia of it becomes so dominant in re referring in the flashbacks to the mother and, and the childhood of the various stages of the mother, combined with the fact that it is a film about, in a much, oh God, this is awful, in much the same way that Eugenie Moon is, in that it is about almost that P Pete Seeger song, uh, the, My Old Devil Pain, uh, and all, all human experiences is pain. Uh, and that actually, you could argue the film is a metaphor, uh, physical pain is a metaphor for all life as pain from these lived experiences of the failures, the rejections, the humiliations of his, of his life prior with his mother, uh, long lost loves, uh, things that didn't work out, and that the body is a manifestation of all of those disappointing things, which would be a cliche in my view. I, I don't think it quite does that because I think he's cleverer than that. But I think a lot of people will see it in that way, or some people will see it in that way, which I think makes the film a little bit more problematic. I, I think, the, but it's about, and that's why I want to see it for how I see that it is, it is about a very personalized individual experience. Because I think if you go too far down that road, you end up seeing it as a metaphor for a life lived, which is a life of pain. 
which is generic to all of us and is a universal experience, although I don't like the, the idea of universalism myself. Uh, so I'm tying myself up in knots here, but... Uh, I, I think I, the political I, is in the personal, though. I think I, I do yes. think as a feminist yes. that that dichotomy is problematic. Um, but it's like, for example, you know, the fact that it seems to be an increasing pain and reflecting a lot on pain, uh, kind of very, very subtly points to, um, you know, the fact of how how much can he work as a film director, as an artist, when much of, of his time is taken up with this, and much of, you know, as you said, it's claustrophobic in that a lot of it is inside either his present day surroundings, as beautiful as they are, or the caves, or anything like that. It's very much, uh, it, it kind of, it metaphorically speaks of the limitations that were imposed on him and you know I, I think that that begs questions of how much can he be in the, the so-called normal world and producing which of course again as most of the films have has, has, re has re relevance to our current circumstances is how, how, how filmmakers making films when, 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 they're, when they're in isolation and when you when you're suffering a lot sorry to use the s word but uh, when you have that much pain how how easy is it to, to work and be successful and the fact that he's not there's that hint that he's not as successful as he was uh does does point to those wider issues i think but is, isn't there also uh, an element in which the film and again it's a cliche that his creativity comes out of his pain because he ends up making a film at the end he's back to writing he's back creating exactly and that line he doesn't know if it's a comedy or a drama is 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 a bit of a cliche in the sense of like the tortured artist uh and again I, not that that's not true to some extent and actually you know all all gray art does come out of pain because if it touches the human experience the core human experience is pain to some extent in, in its various forms so I'm going to end there because I'm, dig I'm both digging myself. That's an interesting point. Just, I think it raises the question of, you know, uh, sorry to be dismal about it, but but for people who have been locked in their homes for the past five years um, with with things uh, that mean that they can't go out, whether it's due to getting infection from from all sorts of things, whether it's you know chronic fatigue, all those type of things. Uh, you know, what about the artists amongst that constituency? Well, what about the academics and everybody else as well? But like, how, you know, in the art world, for example, what opportunities are there? And I, I think this is a very serious question, one that I've raised actually in the real world as well, is, you know, what about those really, really exceptional artists who who were barely unable to get out of bed? How do they actually, how do they actually, um, present that experience well because that those are ex really important experiences too mm. uh, probably uh, the the most important experiences uh, uh, well yeah. I, I wouldn't hierarchize them but having said that it's like you know what films talk about that experience and i think this mm. gets uh, near i'll agree with you <laughs> you are you don't agree with me which is no no, no no i do I I, like I, it, it's it's just i do i think it does everything you say but i'm i I'm just not convinced it transcends that, that, that out of that into the next bit, which I think. Can I ask you a question? Yep. <laughs> Crip camp or pain and glory? <laughs> oh, pain and glory all the time. There you go. <laughs> I think, I think it, it helped. Well, and the thing to me is, is Alma Devar is obsessed with disability and impairment. He is, he's made so many films about it. You know, uh, it's always there. You know, he, 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 he wrote the preface to a book about disability in Spanish cinema as well. So he, he has all that understanding. I, I, I would say this, is, this seemed a, bit, a little bit too personal to actually enable it to escape that. But again, that's not a problem in the film because I, I think the film is brilliant. Uh, you know, and I, I flicked through it again this morning just to re-familiarise because I saw it a while ago. And, and it is... It is worth viewing it two or three times, I think, actually. I think the, the kind of visualisation, the playfulness, the creativity, the, the backwards and forwards, you know, the, the kind of notion of creativity as, as a human experience of, of pain and glory is, is just absolute genius. And I think he's a great filmmaker. 
it, it's just a shame he put his money in uh, bank accounts in uh, the Cayman Islands or the Panama, uh, which which damages oh, his reputation, both to me and to many other fans of his. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I, I, I love the bits, particularly with his mother, yeah. when she's old, when she's old. Yeah. Uh, I think no, because that, it's fairly good as well, though. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, well that that that, and again that that was all a bit too cinematic in the sense that it was very beautiful and and a kind of like and that was the point. It was a kind of glossy version of nostalgic view of the past, uh, and it it. But I thought the stuff with his elderly mother was just you know, for someone whose mother didn't like him, I thought that was brilliant. Oh, you mean it, it, it was beautiful. Actually. It was. Could, could I ask you, because I'm just thinking that people who listen to this might want to know uh, that ch that preface, which book is it in? Because people might want to follow that up. Uh, you know which book it's in? It, 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 I, I've got no idea. Sorry, put you on it, was, the spot. it was 20, Sorry, it was 20 years ago I looked at it. It was after uh, Live Flesh, Carne Tremula, I think. And he, okay. he did a lot of stuff on disability at that point. Uh, but it, but again, it's all it's, you know. And he's he's a guy who knows his stuff. And then actually, it was I thought it was very refreshing to not, in my view, because obviously you think it did that, but it didn't try and escape to be more political, and that that made it much better in my view. But it, it was made by someone who understood all of that and and could contextualise it. So, Miro, final word to you. Uh, well, I, I found a new way to take my medication. I just, all you need to do is just crush it up and put it into a line. <laughs> I thought that was inspired. Now, but I, I think um, it, it was, well, what I thought was quite interesting, it, again, it, and it's something that it made me think of my uh, teaching with disability students and when we talk about the, the role of medicine and the role of medical practitioners in the lives of sale people. Because obviously, you know, it's superficially, some people when thinking about exploring the, the premise of disability, you know, there's, a, there's, no, there's particularly from those who are kind of not uh, familiar with the, the extent of our discussions within disability studies, the knee jerk reaction is, so you're saying that you refuse all sorts of medication and any sort of involvement with medical practitioners. And of course, if you go back to the writings of Oliver and, and Barnes and so on, the idea was, well, it was, it was never about rejecting medicine, but it was finding the role of medication and finding the role of med medical practitioners specifically and putting a parameter around that in your life and not to allow that to blur into the line of then determining your worth and your value in society. And I thought that, from, that again, I, I can't stand for an audience that is not familiar with disability studies that won't come through, but for me it did because it, it, was, it was interesting when he was engaging with the doctors and when he was talking about the notion of, of, of pain and recovery is that he saw, he saw what the role was for say surgery you know to, to address his dysphagia but it but i didn't interpret that as he was pursuing medicine and pursuing uh medical treatment in order to cure him and take him to a position of of what he thought was ideal in his life he recognized the role of medicine but it was about having that determined on his own level so that he could decide you know the, the parameters of of his involvement with medicine and recovery to allow him to pursue what his interests were and what his aspirations were. So I, th I thought that was, that was quite significant. But the best scene is the end scene where the camera pulls back, he says cut, and everything is artifice, and, and it's all yeah. the process of a lived experience. Uh, and yeah. that, was, that was fantastic. Yeah, it was, it was, it was wonderful. It was, and, and, and just the pure visualization of that was, and again, it's it, it's it's a wall, a chair, and a floor, and it's just fantastic, absolutely brilliant. We'll end it there. Thank you both. Everybody goes and sees it. If anybody wants to write comments, feel free. And uh, next time, uh, we'll do another couple of films. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>